Welcome everyone. Um, my name's James Wilsden, uh, Director of the uh, Research on Research Institute, uh, and it's my pleasure to be um, moderating this session, uh, which is focused on uh, the issue of the moment, uh, how we uh, build ourselves back out of the pandemic, which has dominated life in almost every sphere over the past uh, almost two years now. Um, we want to focus in this session on uh, the ways in which the uh, ripple effects of the pandemic will play out in research uh, systems, cultures, uh, the approach we take to the funding and evaluation of research, um, and the ways in which um, uh, research uh, priorities are set over the short, medium, and longer term. Um, as we said in the in the blurb that uh, uh, accompanied this session, uh, we wanted particularly to try and raise our sights, if we could, uh, um, as a group, to uh, beyond the immediate effects, which of course we've seen uh, already in terms of uh, a lot of uh, agile responses by funders and by researchers themselves, of course, to uh, the urgent challenges of the pandemic, but to raise our sights to try and think, well, what kind of mark will this whole uh, episode leave on research 5, 10, 15 years from now? Um, so that is the task we've set ourselves. Um, we are joined by a fantastic panel. Um, uh, I'll introduce them all now at the start and then, and then more briefly as they, as they uh, um, make their opening um, comments and uh, interventions. But uh, first up, we're going to hear from Matthias Egger. Matthias is, uh, of course, president of the Swiss National Science Foundation um, and also played a very central role in the uh, Swiss national response to COVID as, as uh, um, the chair of, of the key scientific advisory committee in, in, in the early months of uh, the last year. Um, uh, following Matthias, we're going to hear from uh, Chinetta Jones. Uh, Chinetta uh, now uh, Vice President for Research at the Michael Smith Foundation for Health Research uh, in uh, British Columbia, in, in Vancouver, Canada, uh, and before that uh, uh, here in the UK at the Wellcome Trust. And I should say also former co-chair of, of Rory, uh, uh, my own uh, uh, institute. So uh, it's great to have Chinetta here. Um, and then thirdly, we're going to hear from Karen Salt. Uh, Karen is uh, Deputy Director for Research, Culture and Environment. Uh, so a really crucial uh, brief in these times at UK Research Innovation, the National Research Funding Agency here in the UK. Um, we are hoping also to be joined by a fourth panellist, uh, Ganson Pillay from the National Research Foundation of South Africa. Um, and uh, as soon as he arrives, we'll bump him onto the panel in the hope that he does, he does join us. Um, but we've got plenty to, to uh, uh, talk about among those of us that are here already. Um, what I'm going to do is ask each of the panellists an open question. We, we thought it would be better not to have big formal talks to kick off a, a topic like this. Um, so I've got some opening questions. And then we'd, of course, greatly encourage panelists to pick up and respond to one another um, and all of you as, as participants and, and attendees to also make um, liberal use of both the chat box and the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen so that we can uh, scoop up and hear from as many uh, of you as well on these issues. So do, uh, do you know, pop questions in as, as we go along. Um, and we will uh, we will turn to those uh, once we've once we've gone through the initial round. So uh, that is the plan. Um, let me start then by turning to uh, Matthias. And, and as I say, you've been centrally involved in, in the response to COVID-19 from a, from a range of different angles. Um, but from those different vantage points, and particularly your uh, ongoing role as president of, of the SNSF, how do you see the longer term effects of COVID-19 on uh, re research funding systems and priorities, uh, both in Switzerland and, and internationally? Um, and in particular, I wanted to pick up on something you wrote about uh, last year. You, you wrote a, a thoughtful piece on uh, the potential pitfalls of what some have called uh, COVIDization of research funding systems, a sort of lurch to, um, I guess, in a sense, fight the the current or the last battle rather than some of the other battles and challenges that may lie ahead. Can you say a bit more about that particular risk uh, and whether you see uh, funders like SNSF and others avoiding it uh, or, or falling into it? Uh, so Matthias, over, over to you. Thanks, James. 
Um, so perhaps what I would like to add to the introduction is that I am an epidemiologist and an infectious disease uh, epidemiologist. So um, the COVID um, pandemic really was uh, something that concerned me both as a uh, chair of a funding organization, but also as a researcher, because I'm still research active at, at, uh, at the uh, university. And I discovered that my, my field, epidemiology, which up to then basically was, uh, you know, a difficult thing to explain to people. And many people thought it had something to do with skin diseases. Um, all of a sudden, everyone knew about epidemiology. And actually, many people were described uh, as epidemiologists um, during, during that uh, phase and talked as epidemiologists. As, as some people have said, uh, you know, the population of Switzerland is 8.5 million. We now have 8.5 million epidemiologists uh, in, in, in Switzerland. And as a funding agency, of course, we felt that uh, we need to respond to this very quickly. And we launched a call in March already. Um, and we took the money for this call out of our reserves. And that's important. And I'll, I'll, I'll come back to that. Um, what, we, what we also observed um, is that uh, everyone in the research community got interested in COVID. And the government told us that we should launch another call. And then uh, the, the second call was sort of additional money from the government, which was aimed at biomedical questions. And then a third call, which we actually will be launching in a, in a few days, uh, which will address um, social science, humanities issues. And an important point to make is that we didn't want to eat into the budget, our normal budget. We didn't want COVID to take over. We wanted to keep the funding for everyone at the same level and to avoid you know, what you described as COVIDization, that everyone jumps on this funding opportunity and the quality goes down. We wanted people to carry on uh, to research what they, what they um, want, uh, want to do. Now, what this crisis in, in Switzerland really brought to the fore is that although Switzerland is quite, you know, a prominent, uh, has a prominent research and science ecosystem, and does well uh, in, in research, there is very little exchange between politics and science. And um, the same thing we have observed in uh, universities of applied sciences and industry, that there isn't enough, you know, people are sitting in their silos. So in the context of applied sciences, we've launched a pilot program where we fund people from industry to go back into applied sciences uh, universities. And we are thinking about um, starting schemes that do the same with the political sphere, so that there is more exchange between science and, and, and uh, politics. And in that context, we, um, and, uh, Jonetta actually alluded to this. We had an exchange recently with the, the William T. Grant um, Foundation, which is mainly funding uh, research on inequalities and in, in youth. And they have a program which is called the Institutional Challenge uh, Program, where, we, uh, where they fund research institutes uh, to build research practice partnerships with public agencies or non-profit organizations. So I think the longer-term impact, and I'll, I'll close with that, the longer-term impact I see coming is that we will invest more in building bridges. And uh, 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 because it was very clear that building bridges in a storm is difficult, and there is not enough exchange between science 
and the policy making bodies uh, in our country. Great, thanks, Matthias. That's, so that's a, a, an encouraging uh, sort of counter trend to, to COVIDization in that sense. Can I, can I just, before turning on to Chinetta, can I just ask, I mean, one big question, of course, that hangs over research funding post COVID will be uh, for public funding agencies in particular, um, whether there's enough money to, to, you know, keep on funding research or to fund research at the necessary levels after uh, all the other economic knock on effects of, of, of the pandemic have been uh, addressed, including, of course, the huge uh, uh, level of investment needed in health systems. And I just, I mean, from a Swiss perspective, how, how does that look in a sense? How is the, the, the broader settlement with politicians and the public uh, with respect to the funding of research? Because, I mean, obviously you as a nation fund research at a, at a high level, certainly a higher level than we do here in the UK. So I think that level will stay. Uh, it will not increase very much, um, but I think it is largely protected. Parliament will protect that level of funding. The situation change is complicated by the fact that we've recently been excluded from the European programs, which is not the topic of today, but which also offers perhaps, of course, it's negative. You know, it isolates Switzerland, but in the short term, it, it, may, it may also lead to increased funding to minimize these negative uh, if effects. And of course, the goal will be to be uh, associated. Actually, the UK is in the same situation, aren't you? Because of uh, political reasons we don't want to go into. But it, it essentially, we want to be re-associated with the European programs as soon as possible. In the meantime, there may be some opportunities for additional funding uh, instruments in order to counteract the negative effect of uh, being excluded, which we witnessed already in 2014. Great, thanks. We may we may return to that question. Yes, we, okay. we are. We'll try and avoid Brexit as a topic, I think. But we'll. Uh, <laughs> yeah, there are there are definitely parallels on that front with with between Switzerland and the UK. Uh, Chinetta, turning to, to Canada, um, uh, within the Michael Smith Foundation for Health Research, you were um, very quick off the mark last year mm -hmm. in uh, going out proactively, surveying and and um, talking basically to your. Uh, research community, those that you fund and, and, and those also that you, that you don't in the wider um, British Columbian health research community about the effects of the pandemic um, and particularly some of the differential um, effects that the pandemic was having um, on, on different groups, very obviously uh, those with, you know, uh, uh, family or, or childcare responsibilities, those with health um, challenges of one type or another. Um, and so I wonder if you could just tell us a bit more about that process and what you learned from it. Um, and then also the extent to which um, any responses that you've made to uh, the particular features of that situation have then been carried through into some of your longer term uh, policies and strategies, uh, i.e. will the, the adjustments that you made during the, the sort of most urgent crisis phases of the pandemic persist um, uh, over a longer period in the, in the way that you approach funding. Yeah, no, thanks, James. Um, so to your first question, what did we learn? When the pandemic was first declared a, a public health emergency, we, like many other funders, and as Matthias explained, we paused non-essential activities and immediately deployed funding to support COVID research that would inform an effective public health response. But while we were responding to urgent short-term research needs, we were acutely aware that there would be longer-term impacts caused by the pandemic's disruption of research. So as you said, we proactively consulted research leaders, the research community, and our partners to understand the impact of COVID on research from different perspectives. And much of what we heard and learned mirrored what was reported around the world. The majority, more than 80% of researchers reported that the pandemic had a negative impact on their ability to do research. And only a small proportion of researchers, about 14%, reported that they were able to take advantage of the new funding and shift their research to focus on COVID. But the pandemic, as you said, had a disproportionate impact on specific groups. For example, women and caregiver, caregivers were struggling to balance responsibilities at home with research activities and maintain research productivity. 
More than half of students and postdocs reported the pandemic had greatly impacted their training and reduced their ability to network and collaborate with others. Early career researchers who were pre-tenure or new faculty were affected by delays and grant competitions and were struggling to build or maintain their teams. And limited to no access to clinical populations or communities, marginalized groups that would have benefited from participating, for example, in clinical trials. So how did we respond? Again, like many other funders, we offered you know, general support like costed extensions, relaxing grant conditions to give more flexibility, extending eligibility windows. But we also made a number of very specific changes to remove any unintended barriers to funding um, and to those who may have been disproportionately impacted by the pandemic. So we revised our application forms and invited applicants to share how had COVID impacted their research plans, their productivity, and any other challenges, even personal, that they were facing. We developed new guidelines and training for peer reviewers on how to take the applicants' COVID impact statements into account, provide more equitable and fair review of all applications. We diversified the membership of our peer review panels and strengthened peer review guidance on the assessment criteria to specifically address any issues of inequity. And we pushed compliance with the principles of DORA, um, working with our panels to recognize the full range of research outputs and focus on the quality and the impact of published works, not just the number. So in terms of what longer term impact, you know, the pandemic will leave on funding strategy and priorities, and this is going to be true, I'm sure, for all funders across the world, the research system is not the same. A lot has changed. The use of virtual technology, shifts in research priorities, and as Matthias alluded to, an expectation that research should be poised to address societal challenges like a pandemic or let's say climate change. And now that we're in recovery, this period represents a critical opportunity to reflect on lessons and insights that we should take into the future. There's a critical role for meta science to inform a post pandemic research system. So just a couple of topics and I'll end with that were kind of inferred by my comments. The first is around research careers and career pathways. We know that postdocs and early career researchers are in critical stages of their careers. They were already sensitive to career transitions. So the loss of research productivity will make it extremely challenging for researchers to succeed in a highly competitive research environment. Disruptions by the pandemic could cause significant setbacks, affect productivity and their prospects for securing funding or jobs in the future. And so there's a risk that the research system will see a loss of critical research talent. The second topic is funding strategies and instruments. And I've, I've mentioned a few, the interventions that we made in our own funding policies programs, but even rapid response of funding, the impact that motive of funding will have and whether that'll be appropriate for, for funding going forward. Long term investments in some areas research will be affected by the shifts in funding priorities. We're already seeing that on national levels around the world. The widespread adoption of open access and data sharing for public health emergencies accelerated the development of COVID vaccines and treatments and have made the case even stronger for open research. And will this persist post pandemic? And the last point uh, topic I'll make is around systemic inequities and racial justice. Long standing inequities in research were present before the pandemic. The pandemic only exacerbated these inequities. Calls for action on systemic racism have activated funders, higher education institutions, publishers, and others to take EDI and racism more seriously, to understand how inequities marginalize communities to make changes toward more inclusive research and more inclusive research systems. So this, James, is a significant window of opportunities to accelerate and make meaningful progress and to evaluate and scale up initiatives that are working as well as monitor challenges or unintended harms on, under the EDNI agenda. Thanks, James. Excellent, thanks, Janetta. That's, that's great to hear. Um, lots there we can come back to in discussion. Uh, I just wondered, you mentioned the role of, of meta science, which is something we will, I'm sure, talk about as a panel shortly. But from your perspective, in terms of the changes that you introduced um, in, in the most urgent phases, as it were, how easy was it to simultaneously build in the, the, the kind of testing evaluation that, that would be required to sort of draw um, robust conclusions from uh uh, on the efficacy of those sorts of interventions in, in the heat of the moment. I mean, I know talking to other funders that uh, while many introduced measures of various kinds, it, it often was very difficult to also uh, put in place, uh, you know, those kind of um, evaluative 
uh, infrastructures around those initiatives for, for, for completely understandable human reasons. I just wondered what your experience was of, of that dilemma. Well, that's a great question. I think uh, to our benefit, we were already thinking about um, strengthening our ability to evaluate, to analyze, to collect data on, on new, not only what we were doing, but any potential new interventions or new programs. Um, and so we were doing that already for um, really prior to my joining the foundation, or my colleagues had done that um, prior to the pandemic. So we were actually really in a, a good position to be able to collect data and to be able to analyze data. Now, by no means what, is it as robust as if we had more time to prepare, but what we wanted to do is we were very conscious of the fact that, wow, this is a natural experiment. We're doing some things differently. It, can, we, can we evaluate to some degree or at least monitor and understand whether what we're doing, a new intervention is working? And I think we were really pleased at what we were able to, to, to see, you know, kind of before and post our intervention. I think the other thing we didn't know, you know, research is not just, I mean, research system, research funding is also a social process. We're certainly not doing things by ourselves. And we weren't really sure whether some of the changes, the interventions, which we would normally not have done, um, in the way that we did, uh, we would have probably done wider cons consultation, explained communication of what we wanted to try. We just did it. And we were pleasantly surprised at how receptive our communities, our, our partners, our panels were to just get on. Because, and, it, and that's why, you know, they, I don't remember the phrase, Christ, using crisis as an opportunity, despite all of the other, you know, the trauma and the, the bad effects of that. I think we saw that. And so we seized that opportunity. So going forward, I think we will have some information, but I think if anything, it's given us the license and, and probably honestly the courage to continue to innovate and experiment and try things and, and to understand what works. Great. Well, that's good to hear. Again, I'm sure we'll, we'll come and re revisit some of that with others shortly. Um, Karen, turning to you, if, if I may, um, you know, you've got this role now at UKRI, which for those that don't know UKRI is, is the, the, the big unified uh, national funding agency here in the UK with a, a budget of around nine billion pounds a year. Um, you've got the role there of, of developing and embedding um, strategies for research culture, integrity, uh, EDI. Um, Security. Origin. Yeah, sec <laughs> you, indeed, they're adding to your list as, as, as the weeks go on. But I mean, all of these issues were already rising very fast up the uh, uh, research policy um, agenda for, for very good reasons. Um, COVID has then happened and in a sense has put even greater urgency behind several of those agendas, as, as we've just heard from Chinetta. Uh, and I just wondered, again, from your perspective, the extent to which, you know, if we're kind of, if we were to roll forward in five years or 10 years, as it were, and look back at the COVID period, whether you think it will be uh, more of an anomaly uh, in the sense that, that there were lots of quick things that were done in response to it, but perhaps the, the effects of those won't be as deep rooted, or whether it will be an accelerant, whether it will lead, as Chinetta was, was intimating in her remarks just now, to some of the bigger longer term shifts that uh, many, including yourself, have argued for in, in, in the way in which we organise and, and manage and govern and operate our research systems. So uh, your, your thoughts on, on that? All right, uh, small question. Um, uh, I, I should also note um, open data is, uh, and open research is, is also in my brief. And um, um, I'll circle back, back to that um, uh, kind of in a moment. Um, I mean, it's interesting the, the, you know, thinking of it this way because um, <clears throat> as a long-term person working on long-term uh, researcher uh, interested in and you know systems and transformations and governance and kind of changes um, at, at various different scales uh, and, and levels um I, I, you know I, I I'd be remiss if I didn't look at that question you posed and, and kind of go probably a little bit of both um, when we look at uh, a whole set of things um, uh, because often it's not necessarily does something accelerate something or is it an anonymous kind of moment? It's what do we learn from it, um, and where does that learning go? You know, do we end up with a kind of institutional memory or a memory within government that kind of recognizes all of this and kind of stores that, so that you might have a shift of um, 
who's at the top of an organization or a change in government, and you haven't lost that set of memory and knowledge. Um, and in fact, you have that bank and you can you can turn to. So, you know, um, uh, I think what uh, Jeanette has uh, just mentioned about that learning is sort of like, you know, that is the type of stuff we really need to um, be, be harnessing, I think, across the sector in multiple terrains. Like, where does that kind of information sit? You know, where can you go and, and kind of pick this up kind of later, kind of over time? Um, but I have some more specific kind of uh, responses other, other than um, the, 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 the quibble with, <laughs> with anomalous and, uh, and accelerants. Um, and I think part of it is, to, is sort of start, starting with the, the recognition that, um, uh, you know, uh, this is the same system. Um, it's the same structures, it's the same funding, and it's the same people. Um, yeah, we, we're trying to move in maybe additional funds and money from different places. We're trying to move in always um, and increase the inclusivity of the people who are in it. Um, we, we, we are making up new structures in various ways, um, and we're definitely thinking about systems transformation uh, across the piece. But it's not as if we've invented a new RNI system to handle COVID. I mean, we didn't. We, we, we took our existing sets of structures and our existing sets of people and our existing sets of systems and, and then try to address and deal with that. Now, we're all interested in transformation across the piece to make this a place where you know, things flourish and, they're, and, they're, and, and people can thrive and great ideas and, and discoveries um, are, 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 um, are, are just part and parcel of the packages of what we do. Um, but that has also meant that we've also had to recognize that the system, just like everybody else, has had to respond um, to uh, pretty seismic shifts. Um, shifts in terms of, I mean, you guys are in my house. I normally give talks globally where people aren't in my house, but that has become the norm of, of COVID. Um, and, uh, and, and that has offered up so many more opportunities for, for all of us to be where we live, to reduce our carbon footprint, to really be a much more accessible kind of community, to really bring lots of different people together. Now, is that a COVID type of thing? Because we've talked about making these become the kind of fundamental ways that we, we exchange and do business, um, but we'll, we'll, and will it last? Will we revert back maybe next year or the year after, depending upon where we're at, just back to the normal hanging out, going to the meetings, having the dinners, doing the various things that are just the kind of norm of what we understand as the professional world of doing research and innovation. Um, and, and I, you know, I, that that's a question of, of whether or not we will we will get that learning and how we will actually embed that within within what we do, because the shifts have been profound. I, while you've come into my home to be able to have this, there are others who have small children, pets, aging relatives, all sorts of other things all around their homes while they're also trying to do their business that's transformed their pattern of how they work um, and the, the capacity and the productivity level which which they've been able to engage because they've had more demands on their lives. Um, uh, people who've had long COVID, folks who are not vaccinated in any capacity who would like to be, but because of various different issues around supplies where they live globally, they do not have a vaccine necessarily readily available in front of them that everyone in the population um, can have all the way through to those who have, but, but, but can't get back into their environments um, because they have other sets of restrictions. So we, we've got a lot of different se seismic shifts, much, much less the economic ones, which are very, very big building upon past economic problematics um, that our system is ultimately responding to. So if we add all of the kind of tensions, um, the inequalities that we know that have already been within our just normal societies, the challenges around capability and capacity, you just get a situation where it's not really just this question of where should we invest our money in terms of this post COVID moment. We've got people who are really deeply tired. They're exhausted. Um, some who are dealing with huge levels of anxiety, some who are trying to figure out what is the new normal for them look like in terms of trying to do their work. And they're trying to do this in often unstable environments where we've seen really shifts in employment rates um, in various different areas. Um, and we're dealing with places that are really gonna have to uh, grapple with financial sustainability um, uh, in terms of moving forward. Now, how do you measure change in that environment? Um, you know, It's sort of like, let's throw everything at it and, and, and then go, okay, well, what has changed? Well, you know, everything for some people, their daily lives has changed. Um, I, I went to dinner with somebody last night where we were masking and we're, we're wearing gel and we're doing the things, we're sitting in the distance, we're having the, and we still worked, but it changed the dynamic of how we were going to do that. I don't know if that will stay essentially moving forward. Um, but I think that there's some 
there's some interesting things that this moment has done in terms of, of, of the spotlight that it has shown. Um, and I think this is the question I have as opposed to an accelerant and, and an anomaly is what do we do with these things where the spotlight has been shown on them in really important ways? Um, and I think the first and most critical one is the one I have mentioned and the one I think Janetta has mentioned as well as Matthias is, is people. You know, whether or not we're thinking of it from a research or career perspective in terms of what people have been referring to it as the lost, the, uh, you know, the COVID generation or the COVID decade or the lost generation, um, all the way through to the individuals who are just overworked right now, right? Um, whether or not they're part of our health services or other sets of um, uh, key workers in food delivery or other sets of areas where they're just, they're just what is going to happen for the future of our, of our communities um, and, and then those who are working it within r and um, What does a career look like given all the demands and the shifts that people within the UK context, a number of people within r and who, who have a health background volunteered for, the, for our National Health Service um, at the start of the pandemic. That was not necessarily as a researcher. They volunteered to potentially do other sets of services um, and other sets of roles. So again, what do we what do we understand now about our, our people that are in the system and moving forward? The pace is the other part. All of these seismic shifts and changes have already um, have already taken an accelerated um, uh, sector uh, into overdrive. Um, often because now the level of, of complexity or the level of challenges, whether or not we're now adding back in climate change on top of trying to think about you know, a global pandemic and thinking about then the education of our youth and understanding um, large levels of mental health, we, we, we are adding these buckets of these sets of problems. So we almost as an RNI sector have to work faster and faster with the various forms of, of solutions uh, or interventions um, and thinking through it. And that has a cost. Um, eventually to the well-being of those, those staff members and the well-being of those communities, uh, much less do we have the structures. Matthews was talking a lot about structures. You know, do we have the right set of structures now that we're going to need to be able to, to work dynamically and agilely moving forward? We don't want a future pandemic, but we would want to get to a place where the types of seismic shifts that we're talking about, that we have a system that ultimately can adapt and respond to those um, and do it in ways that are sustainable moving forward. Not that we have to then say we stop doing other sets of work um, to be able to accommodate it. And I think it brings it to a really big light, the final um, spotlight for me, which is decision-making. I think this is going to be crucial for us moving forward. And that'll be decisions for you know, what we prioritize, how we fund, who we fund, who we invite to the table, much less than thinking about <clears throat> the decisions about um, how we go about doing research um, uh, and, and what does is, what is research and innovation ultimately look like. And, and we've been doing a lot of work, I think, across the globe to think about this from, a, from a, a, an assessment process all the way through to thinking about the inclusion point that Chinetia raised, but you can, you can recognize now that this, this is shining a spotlight on every type of decision-making that we do at the very simple level to in terms of who we partner with, um, what type of commissions we've got all the way to the much more complex ones, um, which is you know, what will we invest large amounts of money. And we probably got to get underneath that to think about how do we make decisions in times of, of, of crisis and in times of challenge and in complexity that does it in an equitable, inclusive and fair way consistently um, and not necessarily be pushed into emergency response mode as the only way that we engage in terms of moving forward. Anyway, those are my four that I, that I find, if I were to look at an anom anomaly or an accelerant, I would say you would get a mixed bag across those four types of things. Um, but but uh, the, the proof will be what we do next. Um, and I do, I agree completely with Chinetia that this is our moment to really get underneath those, to really think how we will go about doing this and then how we will share that learning, but also put in place those sustainable structures moving forward. Karen, thank you. That's great, very rich, uh, uh, multi-dimensional contribution there with lot, lots to unpack and, and talk about. Um, I mean, just coming back on a couple of quick things before we pull to the panel, and, and can I just again encourage, um, uh, attendees to use the Q&A box or, or use the chat box and we'll come to you in a moment. Uh, we can also um, bump people up to be able to ask questions in person if, if, if that's something you'd, you'd prefer. So use the uh, raised hand uh, function if that would be your 
preferred mode of, of interacting with the panel. But, so Karen, just tell me one, I mean, you, I think you captured very well the, the sort of tension between the dynamism and, and innovation that's accompanied all of these quick changes and also just the fact that lots of people and parts of the system are, are at this point um, pretty burned out by it all. Um, in, you know, in some of the discussions around the changes to research culture, the move to preprints, all of the stuff that we've seen through the pandemic, there's perhaps, do you feel there's perhaps a slightly naive assumption that that can become the new normal without enough recognition of quite how <laughs> difficult it's been for funders as well? I mean, all of the emergency response stuff, you know, to, to operate in that kind of crisis mode, as as many organisations have had to do, is uh, and of course the NHS here in the UK and equivalent health systems around the world continue to do, in large part, is 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 impossible on a long term basis. So I just wondered whether, yeah, you had thoughts, I guess, on how one tempers some of the more uh, boosterish enthusiasm for, for for us doing everything differently now uh, with the, the the more prosaic reality of just. You know, there are only so many hours of the day and we've all got lots of other pressures and we're all pretty exhausted. None of us have had a holiday, you know. <laughs> Definitely. You must have you must have this challenge. I mean, as a as a funder, you know, with seven thousand. Uh, absolutely, absolutely. And I think I think some of it is um some of it is recognizing that that quite a lot of uh of the 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 um uh, opportunities and the transformations we're building upon existing things. So uh, I was talking about open data. Well, we, we know that um, the, you know, huge amounts of data was able to be shared very early um, in relationship to COVID because of the decades of work that people have been doing to instill um, open data protocols and processes and platforms um, and to make them available. And then others were able to build on the back of some of those um, moving forward. So it wasn't like we invented that um, to, to share um, uh, that, 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 that knowledge of those sets of information. I mean, even going all the way to, you know, thinking about the vaccines that we, we have that proliferate, that's also built upon a whole series of sets of work that people have done um, uh, in, in terms of getting to a place where we have vaccines scenes. So I, I think part of it is to recognize that some of the, the places we could go, whether or not it's preprint or um, various other sets of things, we do actually have a lot of material. We've got a lot of, 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 of initiatives and thinking um, uh, kind of underneath that. And, and in some ways, the meta science concept is, is this space where, well, actually, why are we working in silo across all of these domains and thinking about them distinctively differently? Where, where and how can we draw this knowledge together? So it's not, you know, this entity over here has to go and set up something completely new. They could borrow and piggyback off of something someone has started over here. We could actually coalesce and be much more effective and efficient um, because we're actually bringing, bringing and drawing things together. And research culture is a, is a great example where there are lots of things that folks are imagining should be now newly created to deal with research culture when in fact, there are some very simple things. Um, uh, and and one, one, one that is often talked about is, is uh, workload planning, like very simple. You know, clear articulations of workload planning can go a long way for folks to really recognize their value and their contribution, um, and and uh, and and to and to have that as a, a substantive kind of conversation. It almost sounds kind of archaic to kind of go workload planning to sit down and put a model together and talk about what sort of fair workload that people might have across various scales and abilities. But you distort that. If you start to think that you have to work certain sets of time period or you can only do certain sets of things or you have to do things, you can see the knock on effect of what that might have for the, 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 the types of ways that you, you balance out your own well-being and your mental health, much less than the types of things that you think, well, I have to have this article in this journal in this with this ranking um, to be able to move forward. I have to do these sets of things. And then we get the, the same set of distortion. And then we see stuff like where um, uh, our reviews that we've done just recently on um, uh, integrity have often pointed towards workload issues 
um, as, as one of those stressors um, that can drive people into a various different practices around research integrity. Now, that's interesting, right? Because it's not, an, we didn't start that by asking people about workload. Tell us what your workload looked like. But, but by exposing, asking the question about integrity, we could see the join up across this other space and it goes, all right, well, maybe the intervention is not so complicated. Maybe it's not this massive thing that we need to do. Maybe there's some base level stuff that we can put in place, I, I think, moving forward. So that's not to say the folks who've got the pie in the sky, naive types of things, thinking as you described, um, are, are wistful, wistfully thinking about a future that we can't ever deliver. But I do think we've got the components already for some of this transformation. And we can also do things at very simple, basic level to start to put in some of the conditions that can transform culture. Um, because that's the thing about culture change um, uh, or, or cultures um, is a lot of it is about practice much more than it is about policy. Um, and these two things kind of go hand in hand together. Thanks, Karen. Um, Matthias has put in the chat, for those that haven't seen a, a link to a, a SNSF meeting coming up uh, next week, in fact, on uh, uh, best practices and research funding. So do uh, take a look at that. Um, now, I am not seeing as yet any hands, nor am I seeing any Q&A, unless I'm missing some vital bit of the tech uh, infrastructure here. Um, Chinetta, you were going to come in. I've, I mean, I, I can keep asking you all questions, so don't fear not. There'll be plenty to talk about. But uh, please do, everyone else, you know, use, you put your hand up or put a question in if you'd like to ask anything of, of the panel. Uh, Chinetta. Yeah, no, I just wanted to, to I guess, uh, reflect on some something that, that Karen said, which I think is really integral, not only about how research systems, you know, will work going forward, but also in terms of, you know, meta research. And I, and it's the, the this concept of preparedness and agility and adaptation, which I think is so key, you know, and um, and so in terms of preparedness, you know, one of the things I think we've learned, you know, to Karen's point is that, you know, there were things that we could mobilize relatively quickly, you know, reserve funds, for example, that Matthias mentioned, infrastructure, which is, you know, not, is also about people and some of the technology enabling platforms. But we also knew we fell short of that, like things when we reflect, we would have liked to respond quicker or more effectively, et cetera. So, you know, really, instead of being in this kind of emergency responsive mode, I think it is a huge opportunity to think about preparedness as, as Karen said about building really um, the processes, the infrastructure, the structures in order to be to better respond to the kind of the next seismic shift that we see because it's going to happen. So I think there's something really important about that and the agility and adaptation I think is really interesting, because again. Um, it, it showed us what was possible and then made us reflect on, well, why, why are things the way they are? Do they need to be? And, and, and there should give us um, the, the kind of really the, the opportunity to say, you know what, we can bring about change. The pace of change doesn't have to be as slow as it has been, regardless of what topic you care about. So I think there's something really important about that, but also from a meta research and evaluative learning perspective, I think that's really important to understand is that I think that from a, at least for many funders, we're realizing that this kind of static approach to the way that we do our funding, deploy our instruments and so forth, put out money, turn away, work on the next thing, and then we'll check in five years to see how things work, it's just not adequate anymore. So really having to adapt um, approaches for how we evaluate what works and so forth, I think will be really important, but also understand again, from for people out there who care about studying, um, at least our part in the research system, is that we are constantly changing. And unfortunately, we're doing it without data or evidence. A lot of it is instinctive. A lot of it is reactionary. And what I think there's a huge opportunity for meta research is to get us, to help us to understand perhaps what, what happened, you know, descriptive, I think work is important, has, has this role, what we could learn from that. And importantly, how can we experiment and take insights into trying new things and doing things differently? And, and so that, that I really love that, that concept because I think that that is the direction of travel. Can I, just, yeah, can I add just very briefly something uh, to this? I, I also felt that Karen's point was uh, extremely well taken. And what I would add is that perhaps research funders should get together and develop a research agenda around the impact COVID has had on um, you know, research and the lives of researchers in their respective countries. And to do that at an international level, to, for example, address 
the incredibly important question about integrity, how that has affected, you know, pressure has increased. So you could hypothesize that, you know, people were cutting corners, who knows? Um, but also on research culture, to what extent has COVID perhaps helped to move towards a more healthy uh, DORA compatible research uh, culture? Or has it actually, which I fear, um, uh, will it actually throw us back? Um, because things get harsher and uh, jobs get uh, scarcer, et, et, et cetera. And, and these ingrained uh, you know, criteria will, will sort of uh, uh, take over again. Um, that's my little input. So I, I would like to collaborate with other funders on, on these questions, perhaps within Rory, uh, Meta Science uh, as well. I don't know. I mean, James is the leader there. And uh, just to look at COVID impact on different, um, uh, 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 different developments and issues, the ones that Karen uh, raised among others. Uh, and James, if I if I could just add one more thing, you know, I think that's great. Um, I, I I I can't. I have no power to speak for my organization or every organization in the world to commit to do this. But um, uh, but if I could be of help as we start to imagine something like that, I think it would be fundamental. And 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 I, and in fact, I would um, imagine uh, you know being able to do something at various levels. So so w one conversation that I started having um, quite quickly with with folks. Um, uh, from a very, various publishers uh, and, and also with James were um, uh, changes we started to see at the method methodological level um, due to COVID. And, um, and, and it's really interesting to start thinking about this this way. Um, Genetti has already mentioned about people unable to access or, be, or participate in trials, but then imagine people unable to go to sites or unable to go to certain sets of places or they can't, they can't access, they can't go to digs. Um, there's still a lot of travel that doesn't happen, and so for those who those who have sites that are that are quite international or that that might involve a lot of community sets of interactions um, or or working in various um, kind of environments and spaces, they're just not able to do that work, or that work looks very different um, at the particular moment. Um, so what's going to happen to the methodologies that we're going to see, the types of projects, the types of questions and queries people might actually put in invest. Um, uh, applications for investment for um, due to the nature of the actual physical conditions um, and the types of real conditions that we're, we're grappling with, um, with restricted travel, uh, with tests and various uh, sorts of regime and, 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 and likely a system that's going to continue to do that for a number of months um, kind of moving forward. Um, we already started seeing people move to more data-driven types of research um, around certain sets of things, especially bank data that they might've had who couldn't necessarily start to do new experiments um, uh, in, uh, to prep for the types of things because then they might've been restricted getting into labs because, the, because lab-based work was restricted for a period of time um, last year in certain areas around the world. And, and these are the types of questions that just from a funding perspective, it's like, okay, well, we if we do if we come up with new challenges, if we create these really good grand challenges and, and sets of work, are we restricting the types of things that might come in just because of the nature of where we are right now in terms of dealing with the pandemic? Um, and that means we've got to start thinking about that from, uh, from on our side as we're starting to move forward um, in terms of what are some of these long-term uh, impacts and effects. Um, and I, I, I definitely, um, I definitely think there's something there because it, that you know we might get to a place where we look back at the papers and the types of patents and discoveries and we can see COVID. We can start to see it quite specifically in the types of work people are doing, not just necessarily the areas with which they're they are researching, but 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 the how. Um, and I think the sooner we can get underneath that, the sooner we can start to help and arm, especially postgraduate researchers who are starting to grapple with these methodological issues right now in the midst of their thesis projects um, moving forward, much less everyone else. And I am um, just in uh, Matthias, in terms of your proposal, I love the idea of, of funders coming together and collaborating, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> excuse me, and sharing information, but I'm going to put a shameless plug for two things. One is that um, in Canada, we have started to do this already. So there was, um, in response to what we were seeing and learning and recognition that we really wanted to seize this opportunity to take these lessons forward, the National Alliance of Provincial Health Research Organizations, NAFRO, the Health Charities Coalition of Canada, and the Canadian Institutes of Health Research 
Um, we are members, Michael Smith are members of NAFRO. We all came together to identify what was happening and, and what was emerging, uh, emerging through COVID, um, both in terms of the community perspective, but also the kind of the broader funding research um, ecosystem perspective. And, and part of the, the insights and the work led to some concrete recommendations about collective action to benefit the research ecosystem going forward. So there, there's a report, it's embargoed right now, I can't share that, but I, this is my, so my first shameless plug is when it comes out, read it. My second shameless plug um, is for the Canadian Science Policy Conference, because I believe that's where the report, the findings of the report will be shared. Um, yeah. I can't remember exactly when it is, but I'll find the link and post it in the- uh, November, isn't it? I think November. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I think um, uh, someone, so there will be a panel or a discussion or, or, or presentation on the report findings. So Matthias, I think it's, 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 it's the start, but I think there's, it'd be really, really useful to see um, whether some of those themes or learnings are true in other national contexts um, and, and whether you know there, there's an opportunity to kind of share that learning more broadly. Yeah, thank you. Although, I mean, that's great. Obviously, uh, it, I mean, it's music to the ears of someone who runs a research on research institute to hear you all call, calling for more work on these things. But uh, and, and we are certainly through Rory, um, you know, as, as I think you, you all know, doing doing work on aspects of this. We've got a very interesting study that um, my colleagues uh, Ludo Waltman at, at CWTS at Leiden and Stephen Pinfield have been doing looking at uh, innovations in peer review systems uh, more on the publication side than the than the grant giving side but um, uh, that will be coming out in November and has uh, we've, we've, we've done a lot of uh, new uh, data gathering from a whole range of, of uh, different scholarly communication organizations so uh, that's another thing to look out for along with the the report from the Canadian system um, we're getting a few questions coming in which is great do keep them coming uh, I'll come to some of those in a minute but I just wanted to pick up on Karen's point about some of the uh, challenges posed by the pandemic to uh, disciplines and methodologies that rely on mobility um, and, and just sort of ask the rest of the panel about that, but also, I guess, expand it a bit to reflecting more broadly on how uh, we may see the, the broader um, landscape of international collaboration changing uh, as we come out of the pandemic. I mean, clearly, as a sort of high level there's all sorts of calls coming out of this for more better coordination between research funders uh in relation to pandemic response and all sorts of other aspects of uh, uh you know health and related research um we also of course in a world where travel is restricted are going to see uh, and we are already seeing in some of the data a retrenchment in terms of the volume and or at least the, the patterns of collaboration that that that, that, that exist in that people are, of course, uh, able to continue collaborating with those people they already know internationally. And, you know, long-term collaborations will will persist for quite some period. It's much harder to set up new collaborations uh, with people you don't, you've never had any face-to-face -face interaction with. Much harder also for earlier career researchers who perhaps haven't had the opportunity to establish themselves, and for whom international meetings, whether it's conferences or other things, can often be quite critical. Uh, points in the development of a career and the building of a network in a, in a given discipline or sub-discipline. So I just wondered how, you know, what your thoughts were. I mean, clearly, you know, the picture there is changing movement is gradually coming back in, but it's going to be quite slow. Uh, so just sort of any thoughts really on, on the collaborative landscape. Um, I don't know, uh, Chinetta or, or, or Matthias, Karen, either of you want to come in on that? I see Karen's uh, microphone's on, so I'm, I'm assuming Karen, you go and I'll, I'll follow. Okay, that's that's great. I, that was mainly because I hadn't pressed mute, <laughs> more than an urgency to speak. Um, but um, uh, yeah, I think um, what you've outlined, James, is 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 interesting. I have a lot lots of different um, questions and I think responses. I, I'll I'll try to focus on kind of one. Um, and I think the, the one I find um, really interesting around this is, um, uh, especially if we're trying to talk about um, what, will, what will collaborative practice look like for the future, for example, um, uh, especially in, in, in the dynamics that we're describing, um, uh, is that I think we've kind of baked quite a lot of stuff into our systems around collaboration. 
Um, so, uh, you know, there are certain sets of things that if you put an application into X, you get to bring everybody to X. We could sit around and uh, you know hang about at, at a particular place, work on. I mean, Volkswagen's foundation has this, um, and Hanover. There are others uh, in, in Italy. There are some in California. They are site-specific types of places um, that allow people to co-locate um, to essentially build upon their collaborative practice um, and their sets of exchanges, all the way through to people who have network grants, right? Um, and the full purpose is to actually bring multiple sets of people um, uh, who might work in various domains and then they might all meet in a particular place because uh, uh, and, and not be. Well, all of those are kind of really interestingly now called into question, aren't they? Um, uh, in, in this moment uh, in terms of um, much less than thinking about the finance model that might live underneath some of this. Um, uh, and, and what does that mean from a financial perspective if everything turns to Zoom? Um, and you're and you're no longer kind of co-locating, and, and I'm, I'm in the midst of trying to set up uh, an international meeting um, where uh, one of the calling cards of of the of the meeting uh, uh, concept uh, in prior days was to bring everybody to a secure location to be able to talk openly with each other um, uh, and and then be able to you know revert. Now, obviously, thinking about carbon offsetting is another sets of things and climate change would be part of the question. But now we're even moving to a place like, is that a value add to be able to do that? Um, could we not, well then if it's not a value add and we could do Zoom, the cost should change, shouldn't it? Um, in terms of what the collaboration might look like. And this is where I think we start to move into some thorny kind of spaces um, around what will collaboration look like in the future. There are some things we, we can handle and we can deal with like, bringing all of us together via Zoom and various things that just make sense. And like, I can do that. We can all agree to come in. But then there are other sets of things about the financing behind all of this, the type of value and time that I'm not too sure we've worked out just yet um, and in terms of the sustainability model about what that might mean. Um, and and I, I, yeah, I wouldn't want to rush to try to um, find a solution about accessibility and bring everybody together and how great all of this is that doesn't really think about that second part of the cost, which is the extra cost that a lot of conferences and other areas have picked up to now bring specialists in to help them manage an international meeting um, uh, uh, all via uh, uh, digital technology. Um, now, should we have already been at this place uh, in the future, in the past? Probably. Um, but this is an interesting set of dynamics to try to put in front of us, uh, I think, around collaboration, because it just, just it just changes the nature of the conversation now um, uh, and, and probably make means we can get to some of the juicy stuff um, uh, kind of underneath that, as opposed to just presuming we're all going to fly to some location or we're going to all co-locate and, uh, and bring people together um, at the culmination of our project or whatever it might be. Yeah, and just to, to add, I think, um, you know, the, the presumption that now that we have digital technology, virtual solutions, new ways of collaborating, and just suddenly this has opened up, um, you know, research in, in, in ways that are, are hugely positive, but I would say that they're essential but not sufficient. And I'm going to just mention three reasons why that's the case. One is around workforce impact. You know, we learned through our um, COVID study talking to researchers and so forth that the inability to hire recruit internationally was had a profound impact on many research labs and research teams. And so it's not just about, you know, mobility or collaborating internationally or virtually. It really is about the, the, the ability to be able to bring new talent from around the world to be able to foster that talent in new settings and ask questions in a way that you just can't do by only um, you know, working with local talent. The second way is really on the impact on early career researchers, which I mentioned briefly, and their lack of uh, being able to network or collaborate. And, and that, again, will have profound impact. So as we all know, we've sat on you know, various different you know, panels. When researchers are assessed, one of the things that they're evaluated against is how big are their networks? How, how many collaborators? What additional expertise are they able to mobilize in order to support some of their research ideas? And the third area I would say is knowledge 
translation, the, how important it is to have those face-to-face -face interactions, interactions between, for example, researchers and policymakers or publics and patients or, or communities, because those relationship building, that trust building is so essential to be able to ask some of the research questions that you need to ask. So I would say that you know the, the lack of mobility, the lack of in-person meetings and interactions are really critically important. And, and I do think that's gonna change and have a huge impact going forward in terms of how research is done. Matthias, did you want to add anything on collaboration and how are you approaching it at SNSF in terms of both um, meetings and funding for, for meetings? Perhaps one thing to add is that at the SNSF, we've been flying in people to sit on panels from the West Coast of the US, et cetera, and from all over the world. And we want to stop that. And we really want to move uh, for the panel meetings, the evaluation meetings, we, we've got about 80 or so different panels. We want to move towards um, a virtual panel meeting uh, scheme. Um, we also would like to learn how to best, uh, you know, manage these uh, virtual panel meetings. We do think that they have advantages that go beyond the, uh, the carbon footprint. Um, in the sense that uh, you really focus on these proposals. You don't have chats during coffee breaks that may not be appropriate about these proposals. You are perhaps, um, you know, less easily influenced by uh, nonverbal communications, et, et cetera. So there may be actual advantage, advantages to having these panel meetings virtually. But we don't really know. And that, that's another research uh, topic. Uh, we're doing a literature review on this at the moment. Um, on the other hand, we believe that the more strategic meetings, uh, we would like to keep them going in person. And uh, of course, in Switzerland is a small country that the public transport is very well developed. And these are main, oft, often exclusively Swiss or only very few. And there we think face-to-face -face is important. We also think that if a panel is new, that a face-to-face, -face, one or two face-to-face -face meetings may be required in order to create you know, a base of trust, uh, calibration, perhaps to some extent that people understand what the criteria really mean, et cetera. And then we would switch to, uh, uh, to virtual or online meetings. So my, my perspective is more from the funders uh, rather than from the researchers, but I, but I think um, it, is, it is an important topic and there's quite a bit of resistance <laughs> against this. People actually uh, like to travel to places <laughs> and, uh, you know, but uh, we'll see how it goes and we need more evidence on it. Yeah, it does strike as a, another good topic for, for more actual empirical work to see what what effects this all has i i mean having chaired various panels myself during covid i mean i think the, the classic evaluation panel can work very well online in some ways as you say matthias it's, it can actually help to um uh even out some of the other factors that may that may be less desirable in an evaluation context but uh it's the more creative stuff that it strikes me it's very hard to recreate uh, and if one thinks, I don't know for others on the panel, but if one thinks about the the, the best conferences you've been to over you know the years, as it were, uh, uh, quite often you know they're the ones that have a lot of other elements that go beyond what you can recreate in Zoom. I'm thinking of, I mean, something like a, a classic US Gordon conference or something where you know you go off you know white water rafting in the afternoon with academic colleagues or whatever. I mean, these are actually quite formative uh, uh, experiences in building you know both collaborations but also friendships that can sustain you then through the ups and downs of of of, of you know periods like the one we've just gone through um anyway I, and also I, I add to that james i mean you know I, i've been at conferences where part of the purpose of actually having it in a particular location 
is to bring in various archives or to talk to various other community organizations or to introduce people to you know, another essential infrastructure um, or a system. So you actually got to tour labs and facilities or understand things and it connected people who, who may be, yes, those who were regionally based and knew each other, but it also brought in people from other areas who didn't really know the capacity and the capabilities around. So, so, so yes, the white water, white water rafting and the, you know, the drinks on the side, very of the things or the coffees, um, but I think also that that ability to to connect on a wider basis um, and to and to really link people into to 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 other sets of things. I mean, I do think um, you know the, the the challenge we're going to have as as we move forward is um, and and I think you know we 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 underestimate two things in this moment. Um, I think the first one is restricted travel. Um, so people who actually have a grant who are actually approved to go someplace and they can't get into that country um, or they can't get out of the country. Um, so I have had colleagues st stuck in places waiting to be able to have the ability to leave um, uh, and because COVID laws and restrictions have changed while they've been in country. Um, uh, but the second one, um, which is one we haven't mentioned just yet, um, and, I, and that is the fact that uh, uh, it is a miracle that my tech has, has, has stayed as stable as it has uh, over the uh, course of this call. Um, and I live in a place that supposedly this is, a, this is something that I should be able to trust is going to be consistent as opposed to um, living some other place where there are differences in my uh, electricity usage over the day and, and, and we're trying to maximize things. So you end up in a situation where the digital divide um, as we call it in the UK, or the, the, the massive swings and challenges for people around technology are acute. They're so acute that we just, we just know them as normal now in terms of people trying to work on every device they possibly have, if they have one, to try to link into a meeting. Um, so that can't be the normal way going forward. <laughs> We're gonna have to do something about that because that's gonna make collaborating kind of hard. Um, if you don't know if you're going to be able to stay connected, if you dropped, if various other things, and, and, and we, we keep adding more platforms, thinking that's our solution, a mirror board or another set of things. And we're still having the, the difficulty of people just being able to connect. Um, now that's been a norm anyway, globally, um, but, it, but this is my, my uh, other point about, about technolo technological possibilities moving forward is we've got to really address that. Um, and, I, and, I, and, I, and I think really um, understand that because it, it can't be the, that we just rely upon it um, because it's just not going to universally operate um, consistently for people. And then we'll end up with disadvantages um, uh, and inequalities. And I don't think we want that. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. But can I also offer at least one counter view, which I think has been a positive. And, and this is probably along the lines of, you know, really trying to diversify, um, you know, who's actually talking and representing and speaking to a lot of these key issues. I mean, frankly, I mean, I'll speak to myself. I, I have lost track of how many different meetings I've participated in, in the last 18 months. But and it's exhausting. But at the same time, um, the ability to be able to be in spaces that pre-COVID I would have never been in. And as a person of color, you know, and being able to bring that representation, that voice to the table has, has afforded me an opportunity in ways that I couldn't. And so yeah, I, no, I, I, I would agree. Yeah. And, I, and so I think there, but there, there's the dilemma, right? Because not everyone, many voices who are, who are not heard and are not represented, don't have the ability to be able to access technology in this way. So yeah. one of the positive things I would love to see going forward post pandemic, and I, I really, I'm really kind of really, um, Matthias, your suggestion about, you know, some you know, kind of commitment to staying some meetings virtual really creates an opportunity to be able to do that. Maybe that's something yeah. we should all consider because otherwise the very few of us that exist, that are, that are accessible, that are willing, you know, we can't be in a hundred different places at once. And I would hate yeah. for us not to be able to continue to participate at the levels or more and to invite others just because we're going back to the old way of being able to communicate. Yeah, no, absolutely. That's a very good point, Janetta. Um, great. I want to move to, to some of the questions that have come in from, from um, the wider uh, audience colleagues who are with us. And again, to encourage people to either raise their hand or to 
put more comments or questions in the uh, Q&A box. Um, Zach McKinney has asked uh, all of you um, what you consider to be the most important metrics for the health of our research systems and cultures uh, and for how well they're integrated with political, industrial and cultural domain. So another big question, and I guess how those metrics or the choice of metrics has changed in the aftermath of uh, uh, the pandemic. Um, so any thoughts on that? I guess if it does take us through to, you know, beyond some, again, some of these more immediate responses to some of these deeper systemic questions, you know, will we actually see the ways in which we measure performance, output, success, or otherwise in the system, altering in a, in a more permanent way as a result of, of all of this? Um, anyone like to, to take that? Gosh, that's, um, I mean, we could have a whole another meeting on that topic, right? Um, I mean, I think it's a brilliant question. It needs to change, right? I mean, you know, we I mentioned briefly Dora, you know, some other, I think Matias also mentioned it. I mean, the, the, the metrics that, that are in play right now are so inadequate, um, so flawed and so forth. And, and you know, you would, you would have liked to envision that the the kind of new technology and platforms allow us to do something more sophisticated, which really has to be much more qualitative in my view. So the ability to be able to bring um, more insight, deeper insight, meaningful insight in what's happening, how, who's effective and so forth, I think is really key. And, and unfortunately, there's a huge, there's a positively, there's a huge need and there's a huge ripe opportunity for the development of new so-called metrics. I'm not really a big fan of that word, but new measures, new indicators, um, to be able to tell us whether the research system is thriving. Now, having said that, um, you know, we, we do have some things available to us and, and, and there's ways that I think that could be helpful, but I think we all have to really appreciate um, that, that metrics don't make decisions, that metrics can further inequities, et cetera, et cetera. I know I don't, I don't have to sing to the choir about this. So I, I think it's a great question, but I think it's a difficult one to answer. Um, you know, Karen talked a lot about research culture um, and behaviors and so forth. And that's, you know, that's really becoming more of an interest. It's not just in the what, it's in the how, it's in the who. And I think that that's gonna be really critical in terms of what we'll be able to access in terms of evaluation capabilities on the, those aspects of research. Thanks, Janetta. Um, Matthias, any comment on that? On no, that? I, I mean, I, I, I think Janetta has dealt with the sort of first part of uh, Zach's uh, question, which I think is really crucial. The second one is about getting out of the silos. And, uh, you know, considering that we have decades left, to, to deal with climate change, uh, that question is, is incredibly, incredibly important. And it is complicated. And I think COVID has perhaps taught us a few lessons in that respect that we can apply to the, the climate change uh, situation. Um, you know, there is this tension between independence of science and having influence on political decision-making and trust. So the more independent you are, um, the, the less influence you tend to have and the less you are trusted. Um, and to overcome this situation where you have independence, in, in, really truly independent input into po policy-making that is heard, uh, um, and that is taken into account and trusted, I have to tell you, I don't know how to get there. But what I, what I see happening is that the people who have influence are not independent or not as independent as they should be. Um, and, are not, and those who are independent are sometimes also quite diverse in their opinions, are chaotic, uh, don't communicate well and are therefore, you know, um, have little influence and, um, and, and are not trusted. And so I, it, I don't know how to get there, what you, what you talk about, Zach. I think it's, it's really very important and, 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 and also very difficult. I would love to hear from you how you think we could get there. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to mention, I mean, as if to bear out some of the points that uh, the panel, I think Karen in particular, was making 
and, and Chinetta as well just know about the uh, uh, inequalities around um, access to technology and, and uh, its effects. I have just heard by email from, from uh, Ganson Pillar, who was due to join us from South Africa, um, and he's just now just got back online after a massive power surge in the Western Cape where he's currently based so uh, uh, he sends his apologies and I guess that's an illustration of, of, of at least that broader point that we were discussing so uh, I'm sorry we haven't been able to have a, uh, a perspective from because I was very keen to in a sense invite uh, a perspective from outside Europe and North America on, on, on some of these dynamics. Um, let me just go to, to, to another question that's here um, conscious that time is running tight and, and again there is still time if anyone wants to raise any others and um, we, we've had a, an, an anonymous attendee asking questions about the tension uh between um uh academics essentially remaining um competitive in terms of of competing for funding and, the, and all the costs associated with that and some of these broader more positive dynamics we've been discussing in research culture and i guess this speaks a bit matthias to your point about whether in a sense we, we are going to actually come out of this in in a better state in terms of some of those tensions in research culture or whether um the the the, the macroeconomic context for many countries and for many research systems is actually going to deteriorate um and and, and this is of course an acute issue in, in in all of the systems that you're you you play key roles in in terms of how much as funders one can um ameliorate or shave off the rough edges of some of of these pressures um, when, uh, you know, the broader dynamics in terms of the funding of, of research, the funding of the higher education system uh, are, are uh, of course, partly influenced by research funders, but, but subject also to much broader uh, influences and forces. So, I mean, Australia would be one good example of a system where we're seeing a lot of redundancies in the university system right now as a sort of consequence of COVID, or at least the reduction then of international students because of COVID. Um, so just so any any thoughts, I guess, on, on I, I suppose, the broader, if you want to put it in grander terms, the broader sort of political political economy of the, the research system and how that will or won't be affected by uh, the pandemic. Karen, I'm going to pick on you for that one. This is big. Um, uh, okay, I, I, I can do this. Um, um, I, I'll, I'll actually circle back to the, the first question for, for just a minute and, and, um, and, then, and then move to in, in, and kind of figure out a way to loop this one in because um, I complete agreement with, um, with Matthias and, um, and Kinesia, but I think one of the things that I would probably add to that first conversation we were having um, uh, is that, you know, I we're in a really interesting place now as we start to think about research assessment um, and, uh, you know, metrics around journals and various other um, aspects. Um, uh, and, you know, UKRI is, is moving forward with um, utilizing the resume for researchers or a narrative CV, which others globally are also doing and really seeing these as ways of transforming the ways people package up and kind of talk about their work and their research um, uh, in, in really, really powerful ways. But I think there's a real big difference between all of the things that we're thinking of doing at that kind of individual level, um, uh, promotion, assessments, these, writing of things, and even the peer review of that and the kind of project type of work. And then the ways we're understanding the system or the ways we're trying to understand uh, institutions. Um, and and we're, we, we've got, uh, we revert to type often when we're talking about measurement there, um, where we have KPIs and we have various different kind of, you know, seven year plan. We have lots of stuff that normally just we chuck at it. So in some ways, similarly to what we, you know, thinking about revolutionizing and rethinking the way we assess and understand and evaluate um, kind of work. I almost think we need to do that around institutions and that, that kind of systems knowledge. Um, that, that doesn't mean that we, we, we don't want to just get, you know, we shouldn't be gathering the information, but we really do need to be critical about how we're doing it and, and, what, and what we know about what we're, what we're seeing. So we don't make massive jumps and claims um, based on, because uh, we don't normally have a lot of really good uh, information that's giving us um, understanding about organizational structural processes. Um, we have outcomes, but we don't necessarily have a lot about those processes. 
Um, and that's kind of bringing me back to thinking about the, the, the question that's just been posed. Um, because, uh, you know, it, there's one thing about thinking about all of that political economy and, and, and various separate things uh, within the system um, that you were outlining, James. But one of the ways that I've been starting to talk about uh, both collabor collaborative practice, if you will, or collaboration, um, is, is, and the system in general, is to think about it as a collective knowledge economy. You know, what would change dramatically if we talked about um, research and innovation as a collective knowledge economy? Um, uh, what would change about that publishing parish, about, the, about the, the drivers and the sense of things? Because we're so dependent on peer review and assessment. We're so dependent on people giving and contributing their time and mentoring and engaging and interacting. We're dependent upon the impact of what that's gonna have societally. That is, that is a collective, right? And, and that means I should be extremely proud, James, if you get a grant or if you get a, a, you know, an opportunity, I should be proud of that for you, as opposed to thinking that I've lost something or you know, snippy because you beat me out to the punch of, of something. Your growth helps my growth. Um, and we don't think about this on a departmental kind of institutional level. We don't think about this. Instead, we, we are all chasing stuff, whether or not it's in an institution or it's at the funding level. And it just breeds this idea that everybody is in um, tension with each other, um, even though we're highly dependent on each other in terms of what we're doing. And I, I really do think the more we can think about the value in those contributions and really start to think about that collective knowledge economy, we can transform how we start to think about how the system operates and works. And yes, the assessment and the other sets of things underneath that. But this is where I think culture can go. Um, thinking about this from a culture perspective means we're not necessarily just thinking about norms and behaviors or different sets of things where we just try to punish this group or restrict that group or sanction that other group because people aren't acting in a particular way, but it's transforming how we even talk about it um, and transforming how we even understand how people engage with it and interact with it. And for me, that's gonna be the most powerful place um, to really stop, um, stop thinking about stuff so transactionally um, in terms of how we think about our system, because right now that is a, that really encodes a lot of the behaviors um, because they're so transactional almost in terms of how people think about almost everything that they do. And that's unfortunate. Yeah, Can I, just a brief comment to follow. And I, I love the way that, that, that Karen just kind of phrased that. And, and it really is about approaching um, evaluating research from a systems perspective. But I think, you know, linked to the first question of the previous discussion on research systems, research culture, I wonder if, if there is something around um, being able to codify um, conditions or characteristics that you would want to see from a system if all of the players in that system are, are behaving and acting in a certain way. So I, I really love that, that this concept, Karen, of this kind of collective knowledge economy, collective impact and so forth. And, and this is, I think, is, is, is probably bubbling up in these national research assessment conversations around rather than um, putting continued pressure on individuals and, and holding individuals responsible for achieving impact, which we all know doesn't work in that way, is to really to, to transfer the accountability to the institutions, to the systems, to as that includes culture for how do they promote, enable, um, create the conditions for that impact to occur. So I think there's something really rich in, in what you just said. And I think that is perhaps maybe where the focus should be, as you said, not at the transactional level, but really the conditions, the broader conditions for what a system, a healthy system or knowledge economy should operate. Thanks, Jeanette. And we should perhaps mention that Janetta is on the uh, panel that is uh, uh, overseeing the, the, the current uh, review of the uh, REF, the Research Excellence Framework in the, in the UK. So it'll be very interesting to see if, if any of those kind of shifts um, manifest themselves in the coming months as, as uh, uh, the national funding exercise here gets its periodic. Uh, I can neither uh, confirm nor deny. <laughs> I'm sure, I'm sure it's too early to say. But, said, these are all, I'm expressing personal views. Let me just clarify uh, yeah. for the record. But, but I mean, I mean you, you were quite in a, in a British funding context. Absolutely, that is, the, that's it. If you want us to choose a single arena to sort of, tweak the balance between individual and collective then that would would very obviously be be one um matthias any quick final comments on this or, or I, I was going to come for a final quick question yeah, yeah, to yeah. no just 
very quickly, I mean, I mentioned the WT grant institutional challenge scheme, which helps institutions to sort of break out of the silo and, and create partnerships. At, at the individual level, funding agencies can open doors to researchers to get out there, out of their silo. They can, you know, fund placements, pairing schemes. They, they can be open to uh, co-designed research where you know um, institutions like the one supported by the WT grant uh, uh, ch challenge uh, are actually involved in uh, designing research together with uh, the academic uh, researchers, and uh, that you know I think might help to open doors to the academic research community out there, see things. See, see other opportunities and not be sort of completely dependent on the academic world and academic, you know, next academic career step. And it would also, you know, respond to, uh, to Sachs uh, integration point, um, which I really think is a, is, a, is a very important one. We do need to get the academic system better integrated with other sectors in, in society. Thanks, Matthias. So we're drawing to a close. Let me just uh, end with a final, very quick question to each of the panelists, sort of 20 seconds each. Um, we're obviously through, or at least in, in Europe, North America, we're through uh, what we hope were the very worst phases of the present pandemic, but we also are clearly confronted with lots of uncertainties, many of which we've touched on uh, in the last 90 minutes. And I just wondered, as you think about these rippling effects through research systems and cultures over the, the next three, five, ten years, uh, where you sort of locate yourself on a spectrum of, of optimism to, to pessimism in terms of, of what this will all mean for research. So, so a sort of gut feel really for how uh, glass half full or three quarters full or, 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 or empty you're feeling about post-COVID research systems and cultures. Uh, Chinetta, do you want to kick off? Gosh, I was hoping Matthias would go first. Um, I, I mean, I'm happy to take a glass half full perspective. Uh, like I said, I think we know now it's possible. And if anything, it's invigorated us broadly as a research community system, um, however you want to characterize us, um, to do things differently. And, and I, I really hope that that much of what that was positive will persist. Great. Thank you, Karen. Uh, well, I'm a certified pessimistic optimist, uh, so I, 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 I strongly like the glass uh, half, half empty and half full probably at the same time. Um, I, I think I, I, I would, you know, com completely echo the points raised. I mean, for me, this is, this is a really good, uh, powerful defining moment um, with uh, a lot of transformation and a lot of really hard graph from people and some great creative thinking. Um, and I, you know, I feel like my job is to figure out how to help that keep going um, and to flourish, but also make sure that people, you know, are able to stay whole as much as they can to be able to move forward. And we just don't keep asking more of, more from, of, of people. Um, so that means I, I'm, I'm a bit pessimistic about trying to make the systems change. Um, uh, and I think probably more pragmatic about how we go about doing that. Um, uh, so we, it can be sustainable in the long haul and not just a big punch um, kind of at the moment. So uh, that, a bit of, a bit of non-answer answer for you, yeah, um, that's, James. That's great. Thanks, Karen. And finally, Matthias. So I, I, I think basically the global, the challenges that we are facing um, have made it very clear that what we've been doing in the past is unsustainable and we have to move in that direction. If we don't do it in a, in a uh, you know, in, in a calm or, well, calm in the sense of we have decades left, we will be forced to do it. So in, in that sense, um, I'm an optimist. Great, good. Well, that's a nice we'll note. We'll get there. Yeah. Good, thank you. Great. Well, thanks uh, to all of you who have contributed uh, comments and questions. Uh, um, huge thanks in particular to, to our panellists, uh, Chinetta Jones, Karen Salt, uh, Matthias Egger, uh, and uh, uh, apologies again that, that Ganson Pillow was, uh, was unable to join due to technical difficulties in the Western Cape. Um, I hope uh, uh, this has at least 
uh, helped us to define some of the, the shapes of debates, which are no doubt going to run and run for quite some time as we uh, totter out of the, uh, the chaos of the past uh, 20 months. But uh, do uh, stay uh, in touch with uh, uh, the community around the Meta Science meeting, which I think is, is uh, in all sorts of ways trying to contribute insights and, and analysis to these questions. Um, there are a number of great sessions still planned through the rest of this week, so do uh, uh, keep uh, logging on and joining in. We've had some great discussions uh, here today and uh, earlier on this afternoon. Um, uh, thanks very much, everyone. Uh, the video of this will also be up online in the next few days. And uh, we uh, look forward to seeing you at the next one. Thank you. Thank you.